Yeah. So let me take this opportunity now to introduce uh, today's speaker, who is Dr. Ray Bentine. So Dr. Ray is a professor in the Faculty of Information Technology at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. He completed his Bachelor of Science in Pure and Applied Mathematics from University of Queensland, Australia in 1979. After that, he did his graduate diploma in computer science from University of Queensland in 1984 and Doctor of Philosophy in Computer Science from University of Technology, Sydney, Australia. He enjoys playing with web and text data and writing code and supports some of his work on GitHub in the name of W. Bentan. His research interests include theoretical and applied work in document and text analysis, machine learning and probabilistic methods, including discrete non-parametric Bayesian statistics, latent variables in semi-structured and text analysis, topic models for semi-structured data, probabilistic interpretations for deep neural networks and applications in medical and health informatics. As far as his teaching is concerned, he teaches data analysis for semi-structured data. And formally, he taught introduction to data science and modeling for data analysis. He was also the founding director of the Master of Data Science course. He has delivered several keynote addresses at various international conferences. He is also the editorial board member of Journal of Knowledge and Information Systems. Data Mining and Knowledge Discovery and Frontiers of Computer Science. He has also served as the area chair for several conferences with New IPS 2020, IJCAI 2020, EMNLP 2020, AAAI 2019, ACML 2018, IGCAI 2018, UAI 2017, ACML 2017, KDD 2017, KDD 2016 and KDD 2015. He is also the member of several international hiring and grant review panels. In addition to this, he is also the fellow of University of Helsinki. And today he's going to share his thoughts on the topic from machine learning to deep learning. With these words, may I now request Dr. Ray to kindly take over and address the audience. Dr. Ray, over to you, sir. Okay. Um, wow, that intro was a bit long. I should have cut back some of that. I, um, uh, I think that intro was targeted somewhere else. Okay. Um, so uh, I've always said that if I could um, get a job programming the kinds of things I'd like to do, I'd probably take it. But uh, um, as an academic, you, you don't do a lot of coding once you get past a certain level, um, there's too many other things to do, which is a great shame. Um, thank you for inviting me here for this talk. Uh, this is a bit of an overview talk. I'm going to introduce general ideas rather than tell you anything wonderful or specific or great, amazing new discoveries I've made. No, this is uh, very much just a, a review and discussion of big ideas. Um, that other people have done largely. Um, so I hope this uh, helps in your understanding of deep learning and where it's coming from. Um, I also like to say this is deep learning from the thought, from the perspective of an old guy. Um, I throw, threw this slide up in, uh, in Beijing a couple of years ago and I don't think anyone got my sense of humor, but... Um, uh, Okay, so what is the context? Well, machine learning is, uh, has gone crazy in the last few years. I'd say there's a phase shift with deep learning. Um, we've now got huge teams embedded in all sorts of uh, uh, big labs and uh, companies just doing um, uh, amazing new cap capability. Um, the other thing is that the results and methods, they're being published before people can get to them. So a lot of work is published on a, say, archive in Cornell. Um, and 
it's old news sometimes before it even makes it to the conference. Uh, I like to call this an academic singularity in the sense that um, really things are moving so quickly, it's hard for us to keep track of it all. Um, and I do think that deep learning needs to be put into the context of the earlier work we did. So just to uh, someone who's not backwards in coming forwards, um, Jeff Hinton, deep learning is going to be able to do everything. Uh, and deep learning is doing a lot of things, we have to say. The, the, the capability in my area, which is largely uh, language and text processing, uh, they've been dramatically changed. I'll try and explain to you why some of that is the case. Um, so here's the outline of my talk. We'll just start with the old. What is the old machine learning doing? Um, so I'm just going to summarize some of the good ideas. So we had hierarchical models, and this comes from statistics as well. We organize things in a hierarchy, and we can generalize that idea to the idea of knowledge graphs. Um, and I hope you've seen the concept of knowledge graphs, which are used in computer science quite widely these days. We, in a statistical sense, we implement these in something called a hierarchical Bayesian model. Um, one thing that old AI used to do is common sense reasoning, but it didn't really do it well. It never really got to succeed at it, but it it was starting. And you can look at this picture. Um, now, common sense reasoning might tell you, well, if you know about America, you'd know this was probably a school bus by the shape of it. Um, but that's not something you'd probably pick up in an encyclopedia, right? Or in an almanac or, or maybe from a, a, a newspaper uh, uh, details uh, or, scientific publication, you'd have to get this knowledge, common sense knowledge from kind of operating in the world. We're gonna guess this person is the teacher just because of their pose and their dress and, and the fact that these look like school children. So there's a lot of, in any situation, there's a lot of common sense reasoning and that can't be dealt with, with our formal reasoning and encyclopedias and theory and it's not gonna help. Um, Knowledge-based reasoning is where we use these encyclopedias or formal reasoning. Uh, and this has been developing from the early days of AI and is now pretty advanced. Um, people use something called knowledge graphs. And right now, uh, uh, a leading edge of, of neural networks is combining knowledge graphs into uh, neural nets, which I, I won't go into that method, but that's a big thing and and they're trying to bring into that to be able to use common sense reasoning as well now the next area i'll mention is is causal models um this is a bit historical actually this is a, a one of the first stats papers i really read 1989 um Lorenzen and spiegelholder two folks who are famous in the world of bayesian networks but this is what they call a causal model. If you smoke, it may cause you to have bronchitis. If you've got cancer, it may cause you to have a positive X-ray. So all of these arrows are indicating cause. Um, but cause is a difficult thing to deal with in the, in the world of data. So here's a, a correlational model. Diabetes is correlated with obesity. Which causes which? And nutrition. Family history correlated with diabetes. Which causes which? We don't know, actually. Um, uh, and we do think now that diabetes has a common pre and obesity have a common precursor. They don't cause each other. They've got something called metabolic syndrome, which is their common precursor. Um, so correlation and cause are somewhat related, but we know and this is one of the first plots we show our data science students. See, here's um, the number of movies Nicolas Cage has been in and drownings in um, 
swimming pool drownings. Well, they just happen to correlate pretty well, but we know there's no causal relationship between them. Um, but we can do a lot of causal reasoning, and I'll show you the example here is with images. Uh, here's an image frame. If we use depth, so we can use stereo to extract depth, we can use sort of a causal argument, which says things that are similar depths that are connected should be part of the same object. Now that's a causal argument and that works pretty well. We can look at video and we can look at things that are moving together in the video and we can say the causal argument, things that move together are probably causally the, a similar object. Um, and generally when we have images, we can um, use our causal reasoning in some sense. Here we can say, my, it's remarkable. All of these people have these uh, little number tags on them and they've all got dogs. Um, well, how is, you know, that just doesn't happen out there in the real world, people having these things. So there must be an underlying common cause of that. An underlying common cause is the reason for them having these shared properties. When I say that, it's actually an instance of a famous statistical theorem called De Finetti's theorem. If you're a statistician, you might know about that. Um, but surmising an underlying common cause is uh, something we do when we see a lot of things that are bizarrely having things in common. How do we use causality? Let's suppose we wanted to predict a car accident. Which of these variables are we going to use? Color of the seat, air conditioning, quality of the tires, external car color. I hope all of you are going to say this one. You're going to use your causal knowledge of cars, right? And so, well, if the cars are bald, if the tires are bald, it's going to be more likely to have an accident. As it happened, the others, air conditioning may be important. I know that because I've, I used to have a really old car in the, in the US and on a wet day, it would steam up inside and I couldn't see outside. Um, so I know air conditioning can be important for driving safety. But we're going to use our causal knowledge of, of how these things may affect a, a car accident to figure out which variables to use. This is the variable we probably delete. Um, and uh, how do we infer cause? Well, the basic idea is we have to do something called an intervention. The medical community, what they do is they run a randomized control trial where they control which variables you're going to change. And by doing that, you get rid of any other confounding or interrupting sort of effects. And with randomized control trials, you can actually test for causality. There are some other ways of approximately testing for causality, but this is really the way it works. And when we have causality, it really simplifies our world. So if we want to, as in a medical world, try and predict, well, uh, what drugs may alleviate, say, COVID-19, um, we need to have a causal chain of how that drug may affect a cell that may prevent the disease happening. So causality is often used as a way of doing things. Um, uh, and there's big models of causality that people use. Um, a recent, this is a fabulous book I'd recommend from Judah Pearl. Um, but basically, causality is now important. Why is it important? Because in this modern world of machine learning, we've got what we call lifelong learning and multitask learning. We were constantly adding new tasks and changing things. You know, lifelong learning, think of it if you've got automatic driving. If you've got automatic driving, you want that driving module to be learning from all possible future things. Um, and we want to be bringing in causality as, as a guide in doing that, as configuring our, our learning systems. So it's a big, big area of causality and the machine learning, uh, the deep learning people are, are trying to deal with it because they know it's important. You saw, you saw how I could use it for doing basic tasks in, 
in image processing. Um, and it's really fundamental. So causality is a big thing we do. Another thing we do is, well, parameter search. So um, uh, now I'll, I'll explain this. There's a technique called a Gaussian process, which I can explain on this case here. If we've got these two data points here, the question is, what data point next? Where do we think the maximum of this function is? Well, we've only got seen two data points here and here. So maybe it's more likely to be on this side. But well, it could possibly here, right? Because maybe the function goes up on this side. Maybe it goes up here. Well, it could go up wildly here, but depending on how big the function moves, but here's not a bad place to text, test next, right? We can test this point. We can say, what's the value of the function here? Because it could have been high, but in actual fact, this is the value we get. So having seen the value here and here, well, you know, maybe the function's flat in between them and it won't change much, but we've still got this other side to look at. So this is not a good, bad place to look at. So, when we're trying to optimize a function, we can look at our current points, see how things may vary and, and try different values and try values where there could be a big rate of change. Um, this is done with something called these days, it's done with something called Gaussian processes, which are a very elegant mathematical model all based on Gaussian regression. Works fabulously in lower dimensions. And this is how we set hyperparameters in our machine learning model. So if you've, um, if you've ever played with a machine learning model, oftentimes they're going to tell you, oh, and there's these parameters you're going to set. You know, there's a lambda and a C and an alpha. You're going to set these values before you run the algorithm. And the question you always ask is how? I don't know what this parameter is. How the hell I, am I going to set it? And they'll say, well, you don't have a choice. You've got to, if you run the algorithm, you want to set it. So um, we set it with these Gaussian process algorithms that use this kind of trick to do their optimization. Um, so this is another technique from machine learning, actually invented in statistics, but really turned into a, a technique for parameter optimization by largely the machine learning community. Completely different topic now. So remember, I'm just giving you a bunch of sort of related things. Um, information retrieval. Here's my original image. If I type this into Google search on my mobile phone, by the way, and I get a bunch of images back. Wow, aren't they good? Isn't that good? I mean, it's got the, the school bus, it's stopped. It's got some people lining up to get in. Remarkable similarity. Um, but what is this? Information retrieval. Well, it turns out information retrieval is a machine learning problem. Except you've only got one data point. So that's my one positive case. And I'm going to do machine learning from one positive case. Now, prior to about 2015, no one really knew what information retrieval was. They could describe what you wanted to, to do. You wanted to get good results, but no one could describe conceptually what was going on underneath. What were the probabilistic systems? How was the inference going on? to do good information retrieval. How are you doing inference? What they did know was there was this magical thing called TFIDF. And you can look that up. It's the, the letters TFIDF. And in particular, something called BM25. They were the bits of magic that made information retrieval work. Why? No one was really sure. They had these partial theories, but sometime in the mid, you know, five, 10 years ago, people, it started to click. 
information retrieval is a machine learning problem where you've only got one answer. And now it's called one-shot learning. And it is one of the biggest growing fields in machine learning now. And, and about five years ago, the, um, the, I, the information retrieval community switched over to this and they started realizing it. And about then, about five years ago, the leading edge of IR switched over from TF-IDF and BM25 and related things over to probabilistic ranking algorithms, which were based on deep, deep neural networks. Um, and you can look at the early development of this. Um, this was a tutorial in uh, Singapore. So another area connecting things, something called active learning, and I'll explain it with this amazing uh, diagram I've stolen from these folks here. Um, so you've got a bunch of bicycles. Uh, you've got a bunch of images. You, you do an image search on Flickr, and you get back a whole bunch of images. But, you know, they're not all, Im they're not all bicycles. So what we want to do is tag the ones that are bicycles. We want to get a reliable set of, of um, bicycle images. In fact, we'd actually like to get, say, bounding boxes on those bicycles. That's an even better version. How do we do that? Well, we've got these unlabeled images that we know maybe they're related to bicycles, maybe not. Maybe 80% of them have a bicycle or two in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to pull out some good images and give them to Mechanical Turk. We're going to pay some members of the public, maybe five cents an image, to enter in the bounding boxes for us and mark up these images and select where the bicycles are. So we can pay people to get us images. But the question is, which images are we going to give them? And the idea is we can intelligently select a subset of these images to speed up this learning process and to make it work better. So we want to select these images here so that these people have an easier time and the subsequent database of tagged images we get lets our learning, our machine learning algorithm learn faster. So that's active learning. And a related area is curriculum learning. How do you present a set of data to someone so they learn faster. Um, very important. Why is it important for me? Because in the medical world, it's really hard to get data from medical folks. So for instance, we get, um, uh, we might get image data about lesions in multiple sclerosis. So where are there little, um, where is there a little lesion in the brain that indicates indicates that's a potential lesion associated with multiple sclerosis. Um, well, it's expensive to get these things from the doctors. And I kind of sort of dismissively say, oh, well, you know, the doctor can either spend four hours with us marking up some images for us, or they can take on a few patients and get a, and earn themselves a holiday in Switzerland. Which are they going to do? You know, well, obviously they're not that mercenary, but you know, that's basically how it is. They're busy guys, busy people. They can't be spending all their time with us collecting data. Um, they really honestly do have lives to save. So it's really hard getting data from physicians. So we'd like to use this active learning process to do that. All right. So that's a bunch of different areas. Finally, from a theoretical perspective, um, the area I use mostly is called Bayesian theory. It's Bayesian statistical theory. It's really a theory of intelligence. How do you do, how do you compute inference? How do you compute things when you've got limited data? And there's a bunch of good reasons why you should do it. There's also a bunch of good reasons why you shouldn't do it, right? It's kind of fun, you know? Um, it, it's really good for guiding you on what and how to do stuff, but it's also got a lot of pitfalls. I won't go into this. I could do an entire 
semesters, you know, entire 20 hours on this, but um, nevertheless, it's a useful theory. The final thing before we get to the end of new machine learning is, um, and really this is probably the most important thing we learnt in machine learning in our earlier 20 years. The first thing is we can, so we've got some, we've got a data set. Well, we can put a, a, a sort of a delta at all those data and, and we're going to get an approximate distribution that just has a, a blip at all our data, right? It, it, it's just the collection of data we have. Then we can look at the distance between our approximate distribution that we formed from the data and our model that we're trying to build. And we can use this distance and try and fit a model. And that's what we're doing in, in machine learning. We're always trying to fit a model theta to our data. And the final thing we often do is we add what's called a regularization term, which is a, another term we add to the model. And it's typically going to encourage simpler models. Now, these parts, the, the fitting function between the data and the model and the regularization term about the model, we then optimize these. So we're going to optimize these for theta. And this is machine learning spent 30 years probably figuring out what to put here and what to put here and how to do this trade-off, right? That's been a big part of our work. Um, well, having done all of this, and I'll just say there's a lot of techniques in here and lots of formulas and, well, we don't need to go into that detail. But having done that, well, in walks deep learning and kind of changes everything, right? And now I'm going to talk about that. So they changed everything. So we've developed all of these slowly developed all of this dif different theory and all of these different ideas to use. What did we learn that was useful from the old machine learning? Well, we're, we're learning about models, how to build a model, how to fit a model. We learned that we can do linear and, and partitioning models really well. So um, if you want to look up, there's something called XG Boost. Um, about a third of the competitions in machine learning these days are won. The people who win it use XG Boost or something similar. XG Boost is a partitioning algorithm built on hardcore machine learning techniques. But if you're a statistical type, you'd also know about exponential family, additive models. But these are the state of the art of machine learning 10 years ago. We're now starting to augment these basic methods with some fancy mathematics, kernels and non-parametrics. Um, pretty interesting math. If you're an applied mathematician, you'll love this stuff. And it's these cost functions that I was talking about earlier, the metrics, and how to use them, how to build them and their impact that really we've been building. And variations using them, something called variational methods. So this is really what we've been learning in the old days. And these things I've been talking about earlier, active learning, uh, causal reasoning, knowledge graphs, all of these are paradigms that we've been building up, but we've been struggling with making them work. So while we've been achieving all of this stuff, what haven't we been doing? Solving speech recognition, solving image recognition, solving natural language machine translation. We were rubbish at all of those things. We were rubbish at, say, radiology. Um, we were rubbish at all the tasks that mattered. We could do some simple tasks with machine learning, but all the really important tasks, we were hopeless. But we got all of this great theory. So in steps, deep learning, and wow, all these hard tasks, they're now well on the way to being addressed. So what have they done? 
what's so wonderful about deep learning? And that's what I want to try and get show you in the next part of the talk. So what they're going to say is, you don't need a degree in statistics, a PhD or something. We're going to turn that statistical part of it. We're going to, going to make it into a black box. So you're going to specify your algorithm with a, with a language, um, you know, a representation language in Python. You'll special, specify your model. You'll specify your, your optimization criteria. Your, and this is these guys oh, here. You'll specify your cost function, again, with just a Python function. And in hey presto, we're going to do the learning for you. The other thing we'll do is we'll port things down to a GPU so it works for it proficiently. And finally, because we're doing all of this, we've got this black box learning, we can now learn multi representations and we can now do things like convolutions and structures and sequences. Now, all of our old school, simple exponential family partitioning models that we spent decades building up it doesn't work with these things. Why are these important? Structures, sequences, convolutions? Because that's how you build language. That's how you build images. That's how you build, you know, mappings from one, from English to French, these sorts of things, right? We couldn't work with these sorts of things properly. Now we can with deep learning, right? So deep learning gave us a, a primitive architecture that's going to work with any kind of data model. Um, we don't have to have special, simple data models that our earlier statistical models did. And also now we've got much more complex models. So we'll, in deep learning, you'll, you can have a, a million, a billion parameters. Um, and now what I say is people are doing what I call modeling in the large. When I first started, I'd be teaching my PhD students how to model and fit every, every variable in their model they'd be torturing over. You know, they'd be doing all sorts of fancy tricks just to get this one variable working. Uh, now, uh, it's all a black box. Don't worry about the details. It, the, now people are, are playing with architectures. I'll give you some examples of that. Um, they're playing with whole sequences, whole convolutions and structures and putting general things on top of them. So this is what's changed in, in the new deep learning world. And this is a great um, cartoon that was presented last year at a natural language course. So this, this would be like second year master's students doing natural language. This is old school. You know, we've got all this complex theory that we teach someone. And, you know, if you work and you work and you work, you might get an extra quarter percent improvement. Oh, it's got, it's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of theory and you've got to do two years of theory before you can start doing any, getting any real work done. So that's the old school of natural language. This is the new school. Some joker who spends half their time up on the ski field, you know, Ah, it's easy. Just add a few more layers to the a neural net. Just tweak your, your cost function a bit. No, it'll work better. That'll improve it by 5%. Sadly, that's what they're doing, right? Now, we can't do that at Monash because we don't have these massive machines. But at Google, at Tencent, at, uh, you know, uh, the, the big... Uh, the big labs, they can just, you know, get a suburbs, get a, a suburbs worth of computer power, get a thousand boxes, computer boxes, you, you know, um, fire up a small generator somewhere and they can just throw more hardware at their model and wow, they'll get another 3% improvement. It's as scary as hell. And that is what, um, that's how you can do really good language translation, say from English to French these days. All right. So let's look now at some of the unique areas of deep learning that are new and changed. So while we were, 
really spending a lot of time developing a lot of hard theory and techniques and general ideas in, in old school machine learning. And these formed the basis of how people worked with deep learning, the cost functions, the models, um, the basic ideas of overfitting. These formed the fundamental theory that deep learning is based on. Once deep learning people were freed of, 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 of statistical detail and now could do modeling in the large, they discovered a whole bunch of new tricks they could use. And I'm going to try and tell you some of them now. But the first thing you've got to do is, well, if you want to understand how deep learning works, go to this website and have a look at, play around with this for a while. But here we've got the simplest possible deep network. There's two inputs, two intermediate neurons, and that's our output function. And if all you've got is these two inputs, you can't, you can't have a very complex function. And there it is, it's, there's a possibility. If we have a whole lot more inputs, so now we've got five layers and there's four, in, four neurons a layer and they're all connected, interconnected. Now we can do quite, quite complex functions. Um, and you can see now the, the blue and the pink, that, that's the different functions we can do. Um, so with multiple layers and um, uh, many different nodes, boy, you can really do a lot more. And when we scale this up to tens of nodes and hun hundreds of nodes per layer and tens of layers, th magical things started to happen. And this was first published, I think there was a New York Times article in 2012, where they were showing this for cats. They had cats, images of cats, and they could see this. But here we have, if we put in a whole bunch of faces, at the lower levels, while we're training a network, we'll earn, learn kind of um, image parts, you know, contrast and shape. At the at the intermediate level, we'll start learning facial features, a mouth, an ear, an eye. At the higher level, we'll learn different kinds of faces, different you know, hair types. So learning with these layers, we're learning features and different features that represent our things we might see in the domain. And this is the kind of architecture they might see. And I'm not going to explain this architecture. Hell, I don't understand what the hell's going on myself. I will be honest. But this is something to do um, uh, visual. It's to recognize events in a video. And it might be recognizing, um, say, when someone is serving in a game of tennis or maybe catching a ball in a game of golf or a game of cricket. Um, so, and these are all the modules that the um, uh, that they're putting together. So here they're they're building a system architecturally, right? Each of these modules may be a, a pretty large set of neurons or, or variables. And here's a text input, and here's a video frame input, and how they're putting things together. I have no idea what the full detail is, but you can see the architecture, right? Here's a simple architecture. This is one of the early automatic driving networks. Um, and there's a bunch of convolutional networks ending up. Um, but we've got 27 million parameters in this. Um, so that's the first lesson is, is this idea of learning representations by having many layers. And the mathematicians can give you reasons for that. They, they've got a, they, they don't have theories of 27 layers, but they've got theories of two versus three layers, right? They can tell you why two versus three layers is different. Mathematical theory and explain why we want to have multiple layers. So the next fundamental trick that revolutionized neural networks, data augmentation, I'll give you a basic idea here. Here's an image, but you know, we can give you a whole lot of variance. We can remove the color. We can change the thickness. We can rotate. 
we can remove the textures. So we've got all different variants of images we can do. People first discovered this with um, digits. And there was a wonderful time back in the 90s, I think, when a group figured out, well, you know, they're only ever given, say, 10,000 digits, and they got to learn from those 10,000 digits. And it was never enough. For, for a data machine learning system, data equals power. More data you get, better result you get. So they wanted more data, always hungry, more data, more data. Um, so what did they do? Well, they discovered they could take the 10,000 images that the postcode people gave them, and they just generate another 100,000 images. They'd rotate a bit, they'd shift, they'd thin it out, and they could easily generate another 100,000 from their 20,000 images. Next time there was a competition, these people just swept the floor. No one else got near them, right? One or 2% better, won the competition. Data augmentation. And a whole new technique was born, right? And so doing data augmentation, and that's a simple way of explaining it, is now one of the major tricks for doing image, at least. And we can do it in other fields. So if you want to do loan assessment, then some data augmentation you can do is, well, if you increase the salary of the applicant, huh, they're more likely to be good for the loan. If you increase their bank balance, they're more, more likely to be good to the, for the loan. That's a data augmentation. So anyway, data augmentation is really one of the key techniques people do nowadays. I like to give a probabilistic version of it. I won't do that here. Oh, I will say it's related to uh, convolution. If you're a, an enge electrical engineer, it's a convolution trick. So what's the other thing, you, amazing trick that the deep neural network people figured out? If you've got three related tasks, um, you can share the lower layers, right? And remember, Our lower layers are our fundamental features. So if we're sharing the lower layers, if there's some semantic relationship between the, the, the later layers, hey, maybe they're going to work. So what's an example? This may be a car. This may be a truck. This may be, um, uh, you know, one kind of, a brain cancer, this may be another kind. This may be recognizing a, a child, this could be recognizing an adult. So they're related tasks, but they're not the same. And if they share the lower layers, then you can train these three tasks individually. And then that lower layer will be shared and, and it'll be trained as well, but jointly. Now, we couldn't do this before, right? We couldn't really string this up easily in, in our old schools. But in the new world of, of architectures, oh, it's easy. It's just a couple of lines of Python. It's all done. Trivial. A couple of lines of Python. So, and people discovered, here's a map of, of things that were related. They discovered that food and fruit, if you shared the lower layers, your classification would work better. If you shared nature and sports, wouldn't help much at all, surprisingly. <laughs> if you shared animals and plants a little bit, trees and plants, that's really useful. Tools and weapons, really useful. You know, food and people, very little relationship. So you can see sort of semantic relations. Um, now here's another task, and it's different to all of these. So I've got data augmentation. I've done sharing layers. This is kind of like sharing layers, but it's sort of done it in a sequential time way. So the idea is we've got what's called a pretext task. And it's going to be an initial task. And maybe this is going to be, you know, learning on a huge bunch of images. We're going to get a million images off Flickr. 
and we're going to learn a thousand different classes, boats, cats, um, flowers, and we're going to train this massive network to do this huge amount of things. Um, having trained that up, we're now going to say, all right, let's start, take this network, we'll move it into a new model. And now we've got a very specific task. It may be um, differentiating people from, say, cars or, you know, uh, differentiating a boat from a bicycle. But we've got a new task to do that is vaguely related to this. So we've trained our model to, to work on this previous task. We're going to initialize the weights from this previous model to here. And now we'll work on this new task and hope that the weights we do will help us get somewhere. And hope that there's enough relationship between these. And you can see it's a, it's a related version to this multitask learning. Um, and we can do it in multiple ways and, and we can sort of, we may fix the, 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 um, the bottom two layers, we could fix the very bottom layer. So we can fix different parts of the network and, and only let the upper parts train when we're running it. So we can do this in different ways. And this technique is called pre-training. So it's a, di a bit different to weight sharing, but it's a similar idea. And pre-training is like data augmentation. It's, if you're not using pre-training, you're not able to compete. It's just amazing. And pre-training is how we do all of our language work these days. For instance, if you want to um, learn to translate from say English to Spanish, uh, no, sorry, English to Catalan. Catalan is a variant of Spanish, but it's used much less likely. What are you gonna do? You're gonna pre-train on English to Spanish. And then you would adapt the model to, to English to Catalan. Now, I'd hope that all of you people doing the hundreds of languages in the Indian subcontinent could imagine how you could be using this for the wide variety of languages with all sorts of relationships, um, richer and wider than Europe easily. Um, uh, fascinating set of languages. Um, this is how it would be or is done. Um, so pre-training and then adapting. So, and just an example, if I wanted to learn to uh, recognize flowering plants, which of these images would I pre-train on? You can kind of guess this one probably, right? You can kind of tell. Okay, so pre-training has morphed into something called self-supervision. And the idea of self-supervision is how what might we best do pre-training? In fact, if we don't have an ideal task for pre-training, so if I wanted to learn to translate from English to Catalan, I know I can say learn Spanish because it's a related language. But let's suppose I didn't have that related language. You didn't know what to do. Let's suppose I wanted to look at, um, and this is a task I might do, to look at ambulance records to look at the text of ambulance records and learn which ambulance events were suicide. Well, I don't have previous tasks to help me do that. So there's no pre-training I can do. What can I do instead? Well, I'm gonna do what's called self-supervision. So I'm gonna make up, I'm gonna make up a pre-training task. So it's self-supervised because I'm going to do an event, invent a task that may help me. Um, I'll give you some examples that people do for this. So if I want to do image recognition, here are the tasks that they do. They invent these tasks to try and build up a network that's suitable for pre-training. 
One is color the image. So if you can try and guess what the, the colors should be, you must know something semantically about the image. Another is to fill in missing patches. So you go around the image and you just black out parts. And then you say, what's missing? What's going to be the missing part? So filling in missing patches, another wonderful way. It's called in painting. Um, another way is object classification, where you give it the entire Flickr database and the entire Flickr tag collection of annotation tags. And you say, right, pre-train on this, and then we'll see if you're any good at doing another task. What do we do for text? Well, we just blank out some words. This is called masking. We just blank out words and we say, predict the word that's missing. Predict the word I just deleted. Or we can go forwards and backwards. We predict the previous word. Predict if this sentence here goes before or after this sentence. So we can make up a whole lot of tasks. People do this and wow, pre-training is wonderful. And this again, this is how all, this is how just about all natural language is done these days with this kind of system here. It's amazing, it's remarkable. And how can we do this? How can we set this up easily? Because it's all done in Python, it's architectural modeling. There's no statistician laboring over every single weeny little variable. You're just laying down a, a couple of, you know, vectors and matrices in Python, architectural modeling, and, and setting this up with some, you know, some Python code and bang, it's all done for you. And this is totally revolutionized, completely revolutionized how we do things. I will say there's a, a very nice statistical relationship between self-supervision and um, hardcore statistics. If we have any statisticians here, it's called pseudo likelihood invented in 1975. Um, that's a relationship. But if you're not a statistician, you probably don't wanna know. I'll just do a few other things before we wrap up on this section. Um, Ooh, there you go. There's some ugly faces. <laughs> but you know, I think in about 2015, this was a state of the art of face recognition, face generation. And in 2015, people were pretty impressed with this. But it's now got to the stage where you can do faces that people really can't. It deep fakes, right? So we know that we could do a deep fake of, um, you know, your president or prime minister, I'm sorry, I'm not up with your politics, but we could do, a, 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 we could create a video of him dancing with, you know, um, uh, uh, Joe from um, the prime minister of England. They could be dancing or, or, or doing just about anything. We could, you know, we could create that video. Um, because the generation is so real these days. But five years ago, they were just starting to do this. What techniques are they using? Well, something called a generational generative adversarial network. And a related thing is something called a variational autoencoder. There's a lot of interesting techniques under here. It's, it's all very busy. Um, lots of statistics. This is a wonderful tutorial that relates them. I won't go into this, but, but um, the basic idea is something called an encoder decoder. Um, and the, the idea is you've got some input, you're going to encode it into a, what we call an embedding, and then you're, you're going to decode it again. We're going to train this object here so that we can generate, what we generate kind of looks like the, the inputs. And if this is a big image, you know, it's a, a thousand by a thousand pixels. If we're mapping it down to just a small vector, maybe a hundred real values, wow, that's some compression. So we hope that if we can map it down and then generate the image, we've learned something. 
So encoder decoder is a basic idea and we can wrap it up into statistics. Um, uh, we can do all sorts of things, but that's the main idea that's driving um, a lot of this sequential or image generation or, or, or natural language translation or um, uh, text classification, text parsing. It's all done in with these encoders, de decoders. Another technique I'll, I'll just say is graphs. So we can do this encoder decoder with, with whole graphs. Um, so we can like networks. Um, uh, okay. Um, I, I think I want to wrap up. I've talked for an hour and it's probably getting a bit, um, I know we, we all have um, terms, but what have I done so far? I've told you the old machine learning, the techniques we developed and learned of that. And these techniques are all the things that we're now using have now passed on and we've, we've, found they had a life beyond old school machine learning. I've shown you some of the big ideas that make neural networks work. The, the layers, the, the black box, the, the optimization, the, the, uh, the um, data augmentation, self-supervision, pre-training, um, and these encoders, encoder decoders. Now I just want to quickly map out some of the new things we're going to do in the, the new theory of, of how we're setting up learning and then we'll leave it at that. So, um, so basically, if you pick up a, a textbook on machine learning these days, it's old, it's dated, you know? It's, it's not, it, it doesn't tell you a whole lot that's important, right? The typical machine learning textbook is, is written 10, 15 years ago, just not that relevant. If you pick up a, 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 a new textbook on, on deep neural networks and there's not many, it's hardly caught up, right? It's just gonna tell you a few basic things. So there's a lot we have to do. We're really building this theory of, of um, deep learning now. There is no good textbook. There is no good introduction currently. There's too much going on. There's too much being developed. But I want to try and tell you some of the big ideas and some of the areas that, and this is how it, I interpret it as an old school machine learning person looking at what's been developed in, in the new world of, of deep learning. Yeah, we've got a message there. Um, suggest some books for teaching and learning the statistical foundations. Um, let, me, uh, let, let me go a bit more on that at the end. That's a whole discussion and I'll have to bring that up. And that's a really good question. Um, really good question. Uh, yeah, I, I guess we're going to let get more questions. I've just seen there's been. Sorry, I haven't. I've ignored. Yeah, particip that. yeah, participants are requested to write their questions in the chat window, and uh, at the end of the session, we will take all the okay. questions. Now, yeah. I will um, send the. Uh, I'll send the PDF to um, to you. Who will I, I'll send it to one of you? Um, yeah, you can make. How would I? Uh, yeah. Yeah, with your kind permission, we can share with the participants, sir. Okay, yep, you can do that. I, I would yep. just ask that you don't um, sure, uh, sir, sure. put the PDF on the network, that's all. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, and as for books, I'll go through a few, right? Um, I'll, but I'll do that after, uh, after this. Um, Definitely, sir. Yeah, so, and I think that may be one of the most important things I can do in my in my talk is, <laughs> is give you guys, if any of you are teaching this stuff, what I think are the best books to go for. I'll tell you what books we, we're doing. But I will say that things are happening so quickly. I really don't think there's good books. In fact, if we even go back to how do you teach probability to computer scientists and machine learning people, I'd say that book doesn't exist. Because what you teach a, teach a statistician or an engineer, sorry, it's not, 
really relevant or not as relevant for a machine learning person. There's a lot they're missing that we need in machine learning. So, um, but I'll, I'll get to that. Wonderful question. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, tasks, let's look at the major tasks. Well, things are changing. We no longer have this simple task of classification is what we used to call it. Um, we've now really got object recognition, which is a bit of a, a it, it's really a, a task that includes classification. So at an image like this, we want to pick up objects and we want to do it with one shot learning. Remember I talked one shot learning. Here's a one example and I want you to pick up some more of them. So I'd like to be able to say, given this image here, find some more people with prams. Given this, find some more vans. You know, so, so object recognition. And object recognition is in text as well. Find me more names of cities. Find me more action verbs, right? So same thing, object recognition, similar technology. And it's all about pre-training, self-supervision, uh, bringing, bringing in knowledge bases. Knowledge bases are remarkably important, uh, actually. People are starting to use knowledge bases in image recognition. And I'll give you an example. You can tell from your knowledge base that a fire truck is related to a truck. Therefore, you can use your recognition of trucks to help you recognize a fire truck. True story. That's just been achieved this year in deep learning. Same with bicycle, motorbike, right? Those connections, are, we can now do them, use the, the knowledge graph of objects to improve our learning and to do one-shot learning quite effectively. So all of that's possible and that's coming out. That's just to remind you what one-shot learning is. They, they seem to have got their, um, this, is, this is an image taken from this paper here. Though they certainly got their example wrong. I mean, I don't know what the, the elephant's pointing to the wrong thing because there we got some kangaroos. Oh, oh, don't know what's going on. But that's what one-shot learning is. Given this one example, find some others. Zero-shot learning. In fact, we discovered really this is what we want to do in uh, medical work because, um, you know, uh, in medical work, uh, we have fabulous hierarchies and we have fabulous um, uh, uh, image data and knowledge bases and all sorts of things. Um, so we'd like to be able to, and we've got this thing called the ICD-10 code. If those of you working in health should be familiar with ICD-9 or ICD-10. And we can use that ICD-9 or 10 to help us predict parts of the hierarchy we haven't seen. That's zero shot learning, where we use a descriptive field in the text without seeing any examples in our data. And so that descriptive field in the text is giving us our zero shot. Um, covariate shift is another example. So you can recognize people and, and rabbits in the bush, but could you recognize them in the city? Probably not. You'd be using very different features. Here you'd use the, the unusual colors and straight lines, you know, of the person's clothing to recognize them. Wouldn't help in the city because there's straight lines and, and standard colors all over the place. Um, so we do have different tasks in the, uh, in the modern world. Shift is what I talked about, the online task of constantly updating. Ah, ah, there's a fabulous question. Okay, I'll get back to some of these questions because these are so good. Human in the loop is where we bring in humans. We're just really starting to do that. 
So um, I'll answer the first question. How do we use deep learning in image classification? Whoa, whoa, a bit general. Um, uh, I suggest you go look at some of the basic textbooks, a textbook on deep learning, I'll, I'll tell you. But basically they set up all their pre-training or their self-supervision. So they've built this deep network that has a lot of layers that are pretty good already. Then they apply it to the new tasks. And that's how they do it. Oh, how can we do it with sound? Oh, hang on, going back, that's image. How do we do it with sound data? Well, sound is basically a, a 1D version of text. And a lot of similar methods are, are done. Uh, convolution, time warping. Time warping is, is where you shrink or, or, or modify the sound. Um, so there are some relationships between 1D and 2D. I'm not a sound expert though, I will say. I've spent 10 years of my life really making an effort to avoid sound and image. So just to say that. Um, from your slide, it says active learning is old technology. Why did it take so long? <laughs> Lovely question. Um, and uh, for it to be popular in deep learning. So um, <clears throat> well, that is actually a question that in fact is not so it's not really a fundamental part of of deep learning, in fact, because the te I'm I've I'm Active learning is a field that I do, and I've got a, a, a recent paper on it that's state of the art. And we probably could have done our paper 10 years ago. Um, most of the technology is over 10 years old. Uh, though the core technique underneath it is a, is a deep network. In fact, it's a pre-trained network. It's been pre-trained on text. Um, self-supervised using um, language. Um, we're using something called ensembles. I didn't do some slides on ensembles, but ensembles are one of the major techniques that, that, get, that goes started in the late 80s and is now the best technique for doing classification. But, but the reason why, to a degree, active learning we had to get into the deep learning area to do active learning is now there's a whole lot more interest in the community for a whole lot of language tasks. And the combination of data science being advertised to the world five years ago and deep neural networks being advertised to the world in the current five years is that now there's a whole lot more people wanting to do learning. So, um, and now we know that, well, we, there's a lot of cases where deep learning is hard because we don't have enough data. So we're saying, well, we can't do standard deep learning. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to get our data more efficiently. So the, the pull to get active learning functioning comes from the desperate need for data. And that desperate need for data, people have been made aware of by data science and, de and deep learning becoming big. So that's kind of the reason I would say. Um, so while I could have built our current state-of-the-art active learning system 10 years ago, except for the base, a basic module there, um, uh, the, the large, uh, larger theory of active learning is, is not used. All right, on to the next thing here. Um, oh, wow, boy, I love these questions. Wow, uh, let me just skip through and then I'll answer a few more. Um, a new area that's coming on is learning to learn, where you lose, you, 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 lose, you, you apply the learning to your learning task, meta learning. Let's see what else I had and then I'll come back and answer some of these other questions. Supervision, we've got weak supervision. I was alluding to this. Um, 
if we want to recognize a propeller plane or an aeroplane propeller, we can use our, our knowledge from our knowledge graphs or our dictionaries to help us. An aeroplane includes propeller planes. There's some, they look somewhat similar. A propeller is an object. Um, uh, so we're using this, these relationships to help us recognize this. And basically, we're using uh, derivatives of Wikipedia, database derivatives of Wikipedia, or dictionaries to, to do this weak supervision. Remember, I was saying that, um, uh, what was the example I was giving? Um, yes, you could learn to recognize a, a fire truck by seeing other trucks. And you would use your Wikipedia or WordNet entries to give you the knowledge graph for that. Um, uh, that's weak supervision. There's other types of weak supervision we have. Um, I've already talked about self-supervised, right? That's one of the big inventions of the deep learning people. Weakly supervised, I've just mentioned. Um, these are some other techniques. So I'll finish this background knowledge then I'll come back to some of your questions. So we now have a whole bunch of different background knowledge. Um, I've talked about data augmentation. What modifications can you do to the data that it'll preserve its um, truth, its class? What weak supervision approaches can you apply? Um, what features may you be doing? Um, and are there related tasks you can do? So for instance, I could tell the system rather than using weak supervision and, and, and knowledge bases to inform it to me, I come in and say, hey, you're doing, you're trying to recognize a fire truck. Here, use this, use this recognition of a, of a regular truck. That'll help you. If you want to translate from English to, uh, to Catalan, hey, use this, do use Spanish. So I can do that. I can provide that information to the people to the system doing the learning. Or I can automatically generate it by weak supervision from my knowledge graph. Okay. Um, yeah, metal learning is a bit abstract. Before I get into that, let's do another question. So this is from Kriti Nemkul. How a, can deep learning algorithms be adapted to achieve state of the art for low resource natural language processing tasks. Now, I'm gonna say here we have a bit of an expert or this person um, knows a little bit because you're using the term low resource, which is exactly the term we would use in the, in the field. Um, so an example I've already given you, how do you learn to translate from English to Catalan, where there's a lot less artifacts, um, examples than, than English to Spanish. Another case would be, say, oh dear, oh dear. I'm trying to think of some uh, minority languages. Oh, well, you know, Oh, I could do languages all the time. I don't think it's going to it's going to help us. But so, low resource classification tasks or translation tasks are when the subject of our learning we don't have much data for. How do we do that? Well, in fact, that is a current state of the art question. So, if you wanted to, um, now I'm just going to go over to my. Uh, um, to my browser. You can't see this. I'm just going to see if I can find a, a particular site. And I'm... Yes, I think this is going to work. I'll quickly share this screen. 
So for this task of how do we learn, say, translation or classification or uh, something when we don't have much data? Well, that in fact is a state-of-the-art task. I'm going to change my share and I'll share now my browser. Um, there you go. And there's a DARPA task. Can you see that? Learning with less labels. So this is a DARPA project. They put in about 30 million or something into the project where we're actually one of the teams on it. Um, we're on this task. Um, and you can look up if you can see who's, I don't know if they tell you who's on it. Uh, oh, they don't. Um, you should be able to find out who are the, who are the groups who, oh, well, uh, that's obviously not going to help. But I think if you did a better search, you should be able to find out who are the groups who are on it. And, you know, how are they going? Um, and if you, in fact, if you probably did a, um, uh, if, if you did a search for uh, mentioning LWL or something other in the, uh, in the acknowledgements, you may actually find. So there's a bunch of papers from places like Brown University, uh, Berkeley, Monash and some others that are publishing results on how to do this. Um, uh, but learning for low resource languages, and it's usually the meta learning task is the task they're doing. So let me uh, go back to my, I'm not sure if that helped, but, but hopefully you can look it up. Uh, but that is really, uh, there's a whole bunch of techniques and meta learning is usually the technique they're going. Um, and the techniques we use really are throw everything you can at it, right? Every trick you can think of, use it. So what are you going to do? Pre-training. You're going to find some similar tasks. Um, you're going to, you're going to pre-train as much as possible. You're going to do weak supervision. So you're going to bring in, use your knowledge base to, to tell you from the names of the class related tasks. Um, you're, you're going to use every other trick you can um, to, that, that in meta-learning to, to do that. Um, okay. Another question here. How is Bayesian statistics related to maximum likelihood? This is from Abdulia. Baldi, and sorry, I butchered your name. My apologies. Um, how is Bayesian statistics related to maximum likelihood? Now, if you remember in my um, talk, I was saying that Bayesian theory is I use it generally as a way of um, doing hard learning problems. Uh, because if you're doing one shot learning, if you're doing transfer learning, active learning, all of these weak supervision, all of these variants of learning, I can get some hints and help from Bayesian theory. It can help me in designing these tasks. And our um, state-of-the-art method for active learning is Bayesian from the beginning to the end. Um, but all the underlying tech, all the underlying implementation is deep neural networks. So, so Bayesian theory is a much broader capability. It shows you how to do inference when you only have one data point, when you have no data point, it shows you how to infer things. It has, shows you how to set up causal reasoning. Um, there's a couple of slides I deleted, but you can set up causal reasoning. It's just another kind of um, probabilistic inference. Um, but what is maximum likelihood? Well, 
Oh, where is that? Yes. Maximum likelihood only deals with the case where you've got a lot of data. So n, n may be greater than a thousand. N may be greater than a hundred. So maximum likelihood gives you a, a function like, uh, you can do a cost function and you can try and make your model fit your data well. And you're using maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood is one interpretation of this metric here of the cost function between your empirical data and your model. Um, so, but maximum likelihood only works in the limit of a large amount of data. And when you ha don't have much data, it's going to start to fail badly. But what is it? Well, it's a, it's a damn good theory. Maximum likelihood tells us how to understand learning in the limit, learning with large data. So all learning theory begins with maximum likelihood. It's the most fundamental theory there is. And I would want a good student of machine learning theory, not necessarily a good machine learning practitioner, but I would want every machine learning theory person to begin with maximum likelihood. It's the fundamental theorem for learning. Um, but when you deal with other cases where you've got less data, where you've got other kinds of information, weak supervision, active learning, other different scenarios, that's when you bring in your pr full probabilistic modeling you start to do different kinds of probabilistic modeling and you need your Bayesian methods to do that. So I don't know if I've answered the question, but that's my version of it. Um, you can, there are, I can point to some great papers done by statisticians that go into the more detail hypothesis testing or, you know, um, because when you start doing sort of more fundamental um, statistical stuff, uh, uh, it gets a lot more detailed than what I'm talking about. Um, and maximum likelihood has fundamental flaws in some areas of statistics. All right, enough of that. So next question, what are the other programming languages used in the machine learning domain? Well, historically, 10 years ago, we used to do a lot of Python, sorry, Java. So a lot of code in Java maybe 10 years ago. People are starting to replace Python with more exotic languages. Uh, I don't know how well that'll happen. So Scala was one that people started to do. Um, I wrote my last large scale programming machine learning system. I wrote it in C in 2014. I, I bet not many of you have written a C program for 10 years. Maybe you've written a C++ program, but in, in 2014, I did a C program. Why? Because I could do atomic locking and all sorts of cute tricks to do high performance, multi-core um, coding and make it work incredibly fast on 12 cores. Um, but pretty much everything's in Python these days. Except R, the R programming language. So a lot of our early machine learning, so some of the early work in machine learning, we get people to do it on in R because a lot of the basic systems that we think are best for machine learning people to learn, like linear regression, clustering, naive Bayes, all of those very early learning systems where you learn the basics, the trade-off between complexity and cost and uh, overfitting and all the fundamental ideas of machine learning. I think it's best done in the R language where all of these basic systems have been done fabulously, right? So we actually teach both R and Python to our students. And all of our basic 
work is done in, in, in R, and I'll show you the textbook for that, which I hope most of you have seen in a bit. Um, oh, maybe I could do that now, actually. Maybe I should, or, or I'll forget about it. Um, shall I? Shall I diverge onto textbooks? Because this is a good uh, example. All right, I might as well. Sure, sir. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I will. Uh, there's a, a few other questions. How many hidden layers? Don't ask me lots. Depends on how much data. Um, again, self supervised. Un GANs are unsupervised. I'm not a GAN expert. I can't really help you. Oh, deep learning and panel data. Um, I don't think the machine learning people have got to panel data seriously yet. Um, it'll be, it'll come under the realm of graph neural networks when it's done. Um, we're starting to do panel data and graph neural networks. I've done a lot of stats. I have a basic idea what panel data is. Panel data is more or less is when you have a time sequence of data, like a rich, you've got a pretty rich vector of data over time. Um, you typically, I, 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 that's probably a very crude, I'm sure Vivek Paulosi would, would expand on that, but um, uh, roughly that's what it is. Um, and it's really common in a medical context where you know, you're looking at someone's medical history and you're looking at their, their records and their tests they've done and, and the various things they've had over time. Panel data is really important. We're starting to do that and we're using uh, graph neural networks. Um, uh, someone's getting a bit technical here, learning rates. Don't ask me, but I will tell you, the learning rate is, is how you modify your, how the stochastic, how does the gradient descent work? So most deep neural network algorithms operate on gradient descent. And uh, those of you who teach fundamental computing have probably done the newton raphson algorithm. Uh, you know, it's, if, if, we're, if we're interviewing a, a, a PhD student, that's one of, the, one of the things we always ask them, how do you code up newton raphson um, And I hope those of you doing numerical methods, uh, most of our uh, good, engine, good engineering students from India know this well. How do you code up uh, newton raphson in a, you know, in, in something, because it's a typical algorithm you do. But learning rate is, is the, the speed at which you use your gradient in your um, algorithm. Don't ask me, that's one of those automatic things they do. Causality analysis, look up the work of Judah Pearl. Um, uh, there are tools for this, I don't use tools, you, do, you have to find someone else. And then, then, okay, now I'll go on to some books. So let's have a look at these books. Um, now, I'm going to have to say this is going to be a bit hit and miss. Um, where are all my books? They're at work. They're not here. If I was at work, I'd pull them out and show them to you. Um, sorry. <laughs> so instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look on Amazon and I'll use that and we'll nav navigate a few good books, all right? So it'll be a bit hit and miss, but I, I know some of the names. Um, so uh, we'll change over to my um, Chromium. And uh, I am a bit primitive here because I've owned, I'm, my, I had a, bike accident and my right hand isn't that useful. It's in a, in a sling, so I'm operating one-handed. Um, so let's do Amazon, uh, let's do deep learning. Uh, what's his name? Bengio. This is the first book for deep learning. Wow, where is it? It's not there. This is it. That is strange. but this is the book, Deep Learning. So um, this is a very good book. It's pitched at maybe um, a, 
a final year level in um, uh, quite technical, uh, but a, probably a, really it's a master's book, but maybe your final year students in, in like an engineering degree could do it. Um, I will say that hardcore machine learning, you probably need an engineering degree um, uh, or a mix. Some of the computing degrees, especially if it's computer engineering, but some of the engineering uh, computer degrees will have enough math to do deep learning, not often the case. So 10 years ago, we had a real tough time getting learning people because you needed really an engineering level math with a computer science level programming. Very hard to find. Um, you needed those two. Um, uh, in, a, in a more advanced program, the, the engineering and the math and the computer science will be together. Um, but we do find that in some of the countries uh, where we get our students from, uh, their, their computing is not as good, but their math is better. They, they'll do more math because it's easier to teach. Um, and in some of the outlying places, you know, some of the secondary uh, universities, uh, Vietnam was a good example. I visited a, a, a sort of a, a second tier university in, um, in Vietnam in, uh, five years ago. And most of the undergraduate students didn't have laptops. Um, that's a cr critical thing, right? If they don't have laptops, they'd never get enough access to computing. When I was doing a computer science degree, I had to submit punch cards for my... I don't know, uh, you know, my hair isn't grey yet, but I'm pretty old. Um, I submitted punch cards and we only got four shots, right? We only had about four nights of submitting a, a program uh, because if it didn't compile once, maybe five shots. If it didn't compile once, uh, we'd have to submit it the next night, right? So, um, but learning to program well that student has to be on a laptop doing lots of stuff. So, uh, but anyway, for, to do machine learning well, really you're going to be doing lots of math, lots of coding before you start. Now this, this one is pretty good. Let's look at the, um, uh, can I do that? How do I do that? Where's my look inside? Oh God, it's slow. Oh, I don't believe that. That's uh, wrong. Did I? Uh. I was trying to get the table of contents. No, it's not going to give it to me. All right, so we'll ignore that and we'll get to some other books. Um, okay, now this, so we have all of these sorts of books. We never really taught from them. Um, they're good if you're learning to code and they're good if you want a bunch of practical exercises, but these kind of books usually don't help you um, to learn the fundamentals. Um, this is the math book I would use, but this again is pretty advanced. So uh, this is recent one. I know Cheng Soon, who's, um, he's in Canberra in Australia. Um, he's actually got some uh, colleagues in India he works with. Um, I don't know, but this is, um, this is probably the best book. It gives you the mathematical fundamentals for machine learning and it's pretty much similar for for deep learning it's the same um, I'd, I'd hope this damn look inside functionality is going to work i don't know why it isn't uh it's always worked i'm trying to shrink it so we can well that's not
Oh, this one's on the web, actually. Let me... Uh... Oh, it's all online. Oh, damn this. Why am I using Amazon? Um, let me just get the, uh, the... I'll look it online and we can actually get the table of contents. There's the book. And you can download it. Fabulous. Okay, this is what we want. So this is the math they're doing. Linear algebra, analytical, analytical geometry. What is that? Distances, um, matrix decompositions, uh, PCA, principal components analysis, support uh, um, single value decomposition, vector calculus, derivatives, partial derivatives with respect to vectors probability and distributions done quite simply but it's not too bad um you know gaussians uh, uh they introduce causality actually um so it's moderately rich and, and quite deep continuous optimization now this is where we do our gradient descent and we start with newton rapson um, and then we get uh conjugate gradient, and then we get stochastic gradient descent. So a bunch of things there. And these are just some examples of using the math. And I'm gonna say the statisticians have it right. If you want to understand machine learning, you do linear regression and you do it backwards, forwards, upside down, inside out. And it'll teach you all sorts of things. Overfitting, um, deep learning, kernels, all the uh, non-parametrics, all those different aspects of hard machine learning. There's a, there's a linear regression counterpart and you can understand it in terms of linear regression. There's a few other things that are, we could probably skip these days, but uh, there we go. So that's, a, I'd, I'd really, rec I think that's a pretty good description of what you need in terms of the underlying math. Um, and we do, most of these you should recognize in your typical math course that you will do in a, um, in a computer science course. So most of our Indian students will have these in a very fundamental way, um, though only the good students will remember them. Uh, <laughs> you probably know that. Um, Righto. And those of us who do like a math degree, we'll, we'll have done these backwards and forwards and combinatorics and, and, and uh, tensors and a few more angles on this. Um, so now let's look at another book uh, that I saw flash past me earlier. Um, oh, it's gone again. Let me, here it is. Oh, I can't spell learning. What do you know? Um, Uh, this, I think, is the next one. Yes, this is it. So this book. This is how we teach fundamental machine learning. Um, you notice it's in R. The reason is... Uh, with Python, there's a whole lot more you've got to learn, right? You've got to learn to be a Python programmer. Whereas R is a lot simpler. If you're not doing anything too complex, it's easy to pick up R. So as a starting point, and there's a lot of really good packages that really do this stuff well. Um, so now I want to try and find their website and we'll look at the table of contents. Um, but perhaps this, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I'll do the history behind this first. So this is the book that everyone now is using usually to teach introduction to machine learning. But these people are statisticians, right? And it's taught in R and it's teaching really a statistical interpretation of, um, look at this, these, that's the book I just showed you. What's this other one here? Well, this, this is the precursor 
elements of statistical learning to the other book. They developed this book, and this book is really good for your graduate students. So it's good for your people doing a PhD or an advanced master's. And it goes into more detail. And it's by the, God, it's nothing there. Let me um, go back to these authors here. It's by the very famous Trevor Hasty, Rob Tibshirani, and Jerome Friedman. Um, God, that was quick, isn't it? Didn't give me much time to look at the, uh, the other bit, does it? Um, but it gives me the table of contents anyway. So Jerome Friedman, uh, he was a Stanford head of department, head of statistics at Stanford for many years. Uh, Ro, uh, Trevor Hasty, he was actually in uh, Cape Town, I think it was. Um, and then he moved across to Stanford in the 90s. But I met Trevor um, when I was still a postdoc and he was still in Cape Town. And uh, he looked at my paper, which was on Bayesian methods for tree learning. And he said, why would you be a Bayesian? You know, as if to say, what lunacy has befallen you, you know, to be, be a Bayesian statistician? Because back then there weren't a whole lot of Bayesians. But these days it's a lot more common. Um, but these guys, this book they did, these three fellows, Friedman, Tib Sharani and, and and uh, hasty this is a fabulous book it really goes into the fundamentals of what we know additive models kernel smoothing linear methods re linear regression um uh, support vector machines unsupervised learning this is a great book um but it's it's at a much more advanced level than our typical say undergraduate could deal with so because it was too advanced they then got a new team together and did the other book. So if you're teaching master's students, advanced master's students, you might teach them this one. But what is, what's it going to teach them? It's got, there's not a scrap of deep learning in here. This is the, the advanced understanding of machine learning as of 2010. Right? Missing a few things. But this is where we are with machine learning um, as of 2010. State of the art, all the statistical understanding um, before deep learning appeared. So in that sense, it's a good book to do. Just historically, I created, I effectively did 15, 16 and 17. I did the very first tree ensemble. I created the first random forest method um, that got the people going there. I did some of the first work on undirected graphical models and directed graphical models, made it famous. So these are the fields that I really got going. Um, uh, but I was doing it in a Bayesian way, so they, they did, weren't too uh, completely different. Anyway, all right. So back to now. So these guys, they had this great book, no good for, master, for undergrads or first year, you know, typical master's students. No good for your typical data science student wanting to learn. So this is what you use. This is how you teach first year, uh, like final year undergrad data science or um, machine learning. It's a little bit advanced for some of them, but, but I think it gives enough for your better students, gives them a bit of meat that they can get to. Whereas the new books on deep learning, um, uh, I, there's no real, there are some good books on Bayesian stats, but I don't have the uh, on hand to them here. Um, deep learning is starting to be written. Um, this is not a bad introduction, but all the stuff I'm telling you about, there's no book on this stuff now. Um, maybe, maybe it's in a, there might be a book in, in print. I mean, currently being developed that has some of this stuff. Sorry. Where did, uh, yeah, here. Uh, gee, did I have this described? Sorry, I'm trying to see if my, uh, there it is. No, I don't have a, a breakdown for this one. Yeah, all right. Um, 
so my catalogue of learning ideas, there's no book for that, um, unfortunately. Uh, and we'll have to wait for that to slowly come out. I think it'll happen in the next while. I think that's about all I had to say. I don't know if I've got some other. Um, ooh, oh, God. Sorry, I've forgotten all the messages. Can you use a diagram to represent causality? A Bayesian network can also double as a causal graph. So we use Bayesian networks for causal graphs. Um, thank you for putting the books in there. Um, someone put some of those books. There's a great book on artificial intelligence, a modern approach. I will just point out that that's sort of that they finished that in about 2005 and it barely changed since. It's very old. Um, there's a book on machine learning by um, uh, um, the earlier machine learning book was by Chris Bishop, which is not a bad one. I'd, I'd do that one as well. Um, oh, I'm still sharing this, aren't I? We could look at that one actually briefly. And this book is not a bad one for, for machine learning. Wow. No. Wow, where is it? Huh. Maybe if we go in through here, it'll connect it. Yeah, yeah, maybe this is the book I was looking for, yeah. Ah, yeah, these two books, in fact. So as of 2010, these were your two good machine learning books. Um, I'll just bring them up. So this one, Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning by Chris Bishop, who's a senior guy at Microsoft. Oh, there's no look inside. Um, and the other one is Machine Learning by Kevin Murphy. He's also, he's now at Google. Um, I'll tell you how this bit book was written. He took every highly cited paper in the last 10 years and he mashed them together and made a, and made 20 chapters. So I, I'm going to say the book doesn't have a great deal of structure and architectural inside. It's really just a gathering of Oh, and then there's this. Oh, and there's also this. Oh, and you can do this as well. You know, I, it, it's a catalogue of stuff. I don't view it as, as a great book. God, I don't help. I just hope to God Kevin Murphy doesn't see this video. <laughs> anyway, but it's, it's a good book as of 2010, as well as Chris Bishop's. Um, thereafter, Deep Learning took over. So they are really the, the only books I'd really mention. Um, Back to the chat, let's see. Uh, yeah, so I will say, um, here's an interest. Someone's entered in some um, uh, stats books. We're really, we're constantly looking for stats books we can use to teach our computer scientists. And it's, uh, there's gotta be some engineers who produce them and, and I'm looking for that. Um, but as for um, what do you have to do these days? Well, you've got to be teaching PyTorch, which is the deep learning framework or Keras. Or, and the other thing is we do, in fact, let me show you. Um, you can see this, right? A survey of surveys. So, the machine learning community is moving so fast that these days I usually refer to surveys, right? So this is just a one I picked up. Um, you can see the, the link there. And this guy, at least person some while ago, had a pretty good job of, of doing uh, surveys. And, you know, you can look at, say, AutoML and there's a bunch of papers and you can find out stuff about it. Um, so if I was doing a, a, a graduate level course these days, what I'd do is I'd give people a bunch of survey papers to read. Um, 
But the first thing you have to do, um, you can't use individual papers anymore. There's, they're all too specialized and specific. You need surveys. But they've got to be damn good surveys because a lot of surveys are just like a list of things. They're just a list. A list of things is useless. It's got to be organized. It's got to be structured so that you can learn something from it. And not many surveys do that properly. Most of them just, oh, and there's this. You know, there's, there's blue algorithms and there's red algorithms and there's algorithms with, you know, polka dots. So it's just a, a list of without much really sense. Um, anyway. Uh, I guess that's about it um, for me. Um, and I can pretty, I'm sure there's some fabulous books in print, right? And being developed now um, for machine learning. Um, oh, I was gonna show you the, the book I like for, uh, here it is. Uh, this is a book I'd give people to learn Bayesian statistics. Oh, I wonder what it's coupled with. Statistical rethinking. Yeah, yeah. So this is not a, a bad one to teach people hardcore Bayesian stats. And it's the famous guy is Andrew Gelman, who does a wonderful blog. Um, uh, some of my student, one of my students went to work for him as a, as a postdoc. <clears throat> so I, I know I've got relationships over there. Anyway, there we go. Um, uh, have we got any more questions? Great questions, by the way, really um, in fights. I'm, I'm gonna copy that uh, stats book that people have put in. Uh, um, in the chat so, so I don't lose it. Any other questions? Uh, I think there are two more questions, sir. Two more. Yeah. One is that nowadays we have several deep learning libraries, for example, Python, Keras, PyTorch, MXNet, and so on. Which one would you suggest for beginners to start with? Um, well, so, uh, I will make some, uh, there's a number of issues there. Now I'm not a great, I pick this up secondhand, right? So when I'm using a deep learning thing, usually a student is giving me something and I'm running it. <clears throat> but for language, uh, we would use the, uh, the hugging face framework. I think I'm gonna have to share again. Um, uh, just because these are pretty weird words. So, and, um, and hugging face is sitting on top of PyTorch, but hugging face has a bunch of uh, pre-trained language models in text. Um, uh, we'd also use the, um, uh, Hugging face, you can see there. Um, the Facebook, and I think it's called Fair. Facebook Fairy Floss. Mm. Oh, Fairsec. So Facebook has a, a also a. They have fabulous stuff in image and text. Um, I'm not sure if they're sitting on top of uh, PyTorch. They probably are. Uh, more people are using PyTorch these days. The, most of our projects are in PyTorch. Um, there's a very good book from Amazon using Amazon's um, one. Um, it's, it's actually a very good book. Amazon Deep Learning uh, Smaller. Dive into deep learning, yeah. This is very impressive. Um, the only trouble is originally that we had trouble 
because it wasn't well enough connected to PyTorch and TensorFlow, which is basically what we use. Um, they may have changed what they're doing, I'm not sure. But there's, this is probably one, of, it, it's a more recent book and they do a great job. See, there's adversarial networks, recommended systems, NLP, um, convolutional neural nets. Um, so this may well be one of the better books currently. Um, the earlier version was using some obscure Amazon libraries, which we couldn't work with. So we, we couldn't use it in our, um, in our course two years ago, but I'm pretty sure it's, it's changing there. See, they've added TensorFlow implementations and they're busy doing that because PyTorch is how you're gonna be making this hit the, the general market. And I will tell you the content is much better in terms of uh, coverage than the early deep learning books, the early one. Um, uh, and I'll be getting my $500 check from Alex Smoller. Now I've said this, obviously I'm joking. Um, let me see what else. Uh, Facebook, yeah. Um, so what happens, all the big companies tend to have produced code and libraries. PyTorch is very common. Um, Google was still producing uh, TensorFlow, but TensorFlow is sort of a low level thing. PyTorch is sitting on top of it. Um, and most of our classes where we're teaching some deep learning is done in PyTorch. Um, <clears throat> It's a bit challenging, actually, because you know you can't do this kind of stuff on a on a um, on a typical laptop. So we have to uh, we we get students. We make sure we're not doing big scaled up stuff, and we get them running it on. Um, we use Google Colab for our, and a few students have big enough sort of systems. Some of them have the GPUs at home that they can run things at home but even our 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 online computers that we give students access to at monash can't run the deep learning systems um, if they find an old uh, you know if they go into a laboratory and there's 20 computers there some of them may have a reasonable chance of, of doing some deep learning but not often so Google Colab is how we do that, and that's in PyTorch. Google Colab is just a, a slightly different version of Jupyter Notebook with Python. Anyway, <clears throat> um, but we, you know, in our in our when we teach deep learning, we'll have a few exercises. You can't give them too much, but um, uh, you want to give them the basics. Um, uh, they, they have to be uh, learning the basics. That's, I think that's about all I have there. Um, anything else? Yeah. The next question is, sir, how to decide the number of layers while oh. designing any learning algorithm? Yes. So, um, uh, no, first off, I'm not a, I'm not an expert, but I will say, um, if we're doing, say, pre-training, right, with, with so we've we've downloaded the um, uh, where was it? We've downloaded the uh, uh, the oh hang on oh. so we've got FairSec or we've downloaded Hugging Face right, um, and so we're using that model. Um, oh, there you go. This I did earlier. Well. Installing, but uh, we're using the hugging face model and, and we may have downloaded it and it's been trained on a couple of gigabytes of english um maybe all the web or something you know it's been trained on english um so and i want to adapt it to do some text classification and i may only have say 500 data points in my in my simple text classification task I want to do. So I've only got 500 data points. I can't learn too much, right? From that, I can't learn 20 layers. Now, 
Roberta, this language model here, this pre-trained language model, that'll be 12 layers. And there's going to be, you know, 100 million parameters or 20 million parameters in this. If I'm going to learn a classification with 500 documents, I can't be retraining 20 million parameters. Those numbers don't add up. Right, if, you, if you've done your overfitting basic machine learning class, you can't learn 50 million parameters if you've only got 500 documents. So, and that's why we give people the linear regression stuff early on so they get a feel for these numbers. So, <clears throat> what do we do? Well, I add a, say two output layers or something to the Roberta stack. And those output layers, they'll only have a couple of thousand parameters. And I train them. Or I let it retrain only the top layer of Bert, Roberta, not the full 12 layers, just the top layer. So how many layers do I use? Well, it depends on the pre-training. If I'm pre-training, and how many layers do I let it retrain? And how many layers do I fix? Um, and if I don't have much data, if I've only, I've only got 500 data points, I can't have a lot of layers. When they're training this 12 layer monster network, they've got billions of, of words. They've got millions of documents. Um, so they can train up this monster. They've got enough data. Um, if I've only got a hundred documents, well, I'm only gonna have say a few layers. Because uh, that's all I can really train up. But if I'm doing pre-training, I can do 12 layers. And then I'll only then it retrain the top parts of it. So when you say how many layers, well, it is, it is dependent. But there is another sort of gotcha. Um, deep neural networks do behave a bit differently to old school linear regression. And I did have a slide on that in an earlier version of my talk, but I got rid of it. Um, and uh, yes, I can. I can show you actually. It's. It, I can show you the basic idea. Oh, do I have my? Um, yeah. This is a terribly important concept, actually, and I. I don't know why I deleted it. Um, in fact, I, I think it's one of the most fundamental things of why these techniques work. And I don't think enough people realize it. And that's because most deep learning people haven't had classical training, right? So they're missing a lot of stuff. But let's look at there. Okay, look at this network. Massive symmetry. Massive symmetry. These nodes are all symmetric. I can just rotate the values and I've got the same network. Massive symmetry in that. Whereas if I'm doing, say, linear regression, in, if I'm doing linear regression, I've only got one layer, right? All the other layers have disappeared. I've only got one layer. This layer is X. This layer is X squared. This layer is x cubed. This layer is, you know, x to the fourth or something like that. So when I'm doing linear regression, every single node has a completely different function. No symmetry, zero symmetry, nothing, zilch. Whereas in here, massive symmetry. What does that mean? It completely changes the optimization. Absolutely, completely. So you can have a, you know, you've got like 20, 10 nodes here. You can swap them any way you like. You get the similar thing. So what happens is when you're optimizing, each of these is slightly off from random. And each of these is then going to drift towards something that's better for them. So by using a deep neural network, almost, almost you're doing parallel search. 
because each of these nodes effectively is able to do its own little search in parallel. Not quite, but almost. So deep learning has a, an incredible way of parallelizing things. As these nodes are trained up, they'll gradually drift to more and more useful things. And because of the symmetry, they're not gonna get in the way of each other. In, in linear regression, this is X squared. It's always X squared. It's never gonna be anything else. And it, it means that the search is very artificial and restricted and, and has to do certain things. Whereas in the deep learning case, the, the search is very flexible. I, I don't, and, um, it's hard to kind of, um, I haven't seen this discussed properly anywhere, but it's something I, you, you, you know, we, we kind of get a handle on from, it's actually something we picked up in topic modeling. Um, and uh, uh, it's very clear theoretically. I, I haven't cornered a, a hardcore theoretician yet on this, but the symmetry is fundamental. The fact that you've got massive symmetry and the support that gives you to almost do parallel search is incredible. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. <clears throat> Now, as you can see, our chat window is full of appreciation messages. Thank you. Yeah, it, 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 it's great to speak to, a, you know, asking good questions, good questions. What can you teach? You know, what books? It's really nice to go over this stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I hope this was useful. So people are also interested in getting touch with you late after this event also. So can we share your uh, contact details with the people? Um, absolutely. I will email to you my, uh, my slide. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and uh, happy to talk a bit further. Um, uh, um, uh, and so I'm, yeah, and I'm inviting you for the conference, which we are going to hold in the month of uh, October this year only. Oh. That conference is also an international conference on the concept of advances and applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Oh, okay. A bit more focused. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, that's a Springer conference and it's second one in the series, sir. Last year we had one. So I would okay. like to invite you for that also as a keynote speaker and uh, in other capacities also like in the technical advisory board, international Thank advisory you. I'd, board. I'd, I'd love to be involved. Um, uh, um, I did have a trip to India planned actually late last year and everything got canceled. Um, yeah. So, in future, whenever you plan to visit to India, yeah. do visit Sharda University. We'll be happy to host you, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's a, um, probably a year in the future or so, uh, a year and a half. But um, uh, in Australia, we're all captured. We're not allowed out of the country currently. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. So, but that'll that'll change. Yeah, definitely, sir. Definitely, yeah, yeah. when whenever the situation changes, we welcome you. Most welcome yeah. to India. Ah, good. Okay, because I know it's a, a, a fabulous uh, uh, source of uh, students for us is the Indian subcontinent and the amazing yeah. students, amazing faculty. Um, I've worked a little bit with at uh, IIT Delhi, um, IIT uh, no IIT. Bombay, because the real name is Mumbai of the city, of course. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just what I, I visited there once, and just amazing, the the students, the quality, but also the faculty, what they do with not enough support, um, is blew me away. The teaching yeah. they're doing, the 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 quality of work, the the you know the masters the fact they were able to do all of this work i i just have to say it was always very impressive um most so welcome you, sir yeah most hopefully welcome whenever you plan whenever you get time whenever you could plan do visit sharda university we'll be more than okay. happy to host you sir it'll happen i'll i'll have some very interesting stories to tell you in um uh in october there's there's big news coming out so um, more interesting things yeah yeah, yeah. 
Thank you very much. This was, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much for sparing your valuable time and delivering such a nice talk, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so email me. Thank you. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye, sir. Bye. Get in yeah. touch. Yeah. So participants, tomorrow we have session at 10.30 a.m. and uh, it's going to be a very good session because the speaker is from criticalvision.ai, which is a leading AI company in India. So the speaker is the CEO of that company. So I request you to join well in time. So that because tomorrow also we'll be pressed for the time because we'll be having another session uh, from 12 to 1 p.m. I think 1 to 2 p.m. Yeah, 1 to 2 p.m. And third session from 2.30 uh, 2 p.m. onwards. So kindly join well in time. Thank you, everyone.